I'm Tracy Bills from the first board of directors, and I have the pleasure this morning of facilitating the updates from the special interest groups. Uh, so first up this morning is the CVSS SIG, Dave Dugall. Thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome to a wicked early morning on the last day of the SIG. So uh, I will go as quickly as possible as long as I know which button to push. So uh, as you may or may not have heard, CVSS is the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, and we've been through several iterations from uh, back in the days when we just thought it was a pretty cool idea to uh, now having version 4.0 being worked. So the, uh, the major high-level accomplishments for 4.0 are uh, based on feedback from uh, 30 members that attend every week for several years. So after 3,000 hours of uh, person hours of effort, we've come up with uh, finer granularity for base metrics, which is uh, something that has been asked for. Um, as you know, CVSS goes from zero to 10, and sometimes there are bucketizations, so we're trying to add a little more fluidity to those 99 values. Uh, we've added attack requirements, uh, enhanced user interaction, Sometimes there's uh, uh, an easy way to fool uh, a, uh, a user, and sometimes it's a difficult way. So now we have a little more granularity there. Um, everybody loves scope, so this is going to cause a tear to, into everyone's eye, but we've decided to remove scope and instead remove that lossy compression and increase the confidentiality, integrity, and availability to the vulnerable and impacted components. So that, that should help a little bit uh, in being able to convey and surprisingly have Juniper and Cisco actually agree on scoring. Um, there's also, uh, temporal has always been this sort of concept of time, but really it's threat. So what we've done is replace temporal with the threat metrics. And also there have been a couple of um, metrics that are always the same, almost always the same value. Uh, usually uh, an evil vendor won't come out with an advisory until we already have a fix. So we already know what the fixed state is. And we also know um, that it's pretty confident if we're going to publish an advisory that there's uh, that there's, it's confirmed. So we've, we've boiled that down to exploit maturity. That actually works pretty, pretty well with the concepts like EPSS where um, you have a, a threat based on exploit maturity. Um, and then the new thing is uh, supplemental metrics. Uh, there are a lot of, so the, the base metrics are the intrinsic characteristics of a vulnerability. Supplemental metrics give you the, the kind of the just-in-time additional information that may or may not be required uh, to make a decision on whether to patch. Because at the end of the day, you want patch priority, among many things. So uh, we've added supplemental metrics, automatable recovery, value density, uh, vulnerability response effort, and provider urgency. I could spend a half hour on each of those, and at 10 o'clock I probably will. Uh, but it does quite align to another four-letter. Um, acronym SSVC. So some of those things you may have seen in the SSVC presentation, they do align uh, precisely with that. It's decision tree. Um, and finally, um, those of us who have been around for a while believe that Sun workstations and, and Juniper routers run the world, but in fact there's this whole other part of the world called OT, Operational Technology, ICS. Uh, these things keep us alive, so we have tipped our hat toward that by adding additional safety metrics that will allow people in the OT world that can decide whether a PLC may keep a fish tank too cold or you know, cause a nuclear power plant to get too warm um, to score those types of things as well. We also have overarching messages. None, none of these are, are, are quite new to anyone who has uh, seen any blog post on CVSS. Um, we have technical severity in CVSS. We do not imply or infer risk. Um, we are going to help people. After you've had enough NVD lookups to find out that there's V2 and VT, V3 scores for just about everything, you really don't want three scores for everything now. So we're going to have some guidance on how to migrate from three to four. It's a less of a step change than two to three. Um, and basically give um, more importance on uh, the education. Uh, it, it's quite important to get CVSS right. Uh, anyone with a blog post or a, a GoDaddy domain can create a CVSS score for just about anything, but authoritative scores that are accurate and aligned with NVD are important, and I think training is, is part of the, the, the um, solution to that. And of course, the final thing is everybody loves grabbing CVSS base scores, putting them into an Excel spreadsheet, sorting by technical severity and patching the top first. That's not the way it's supposed to work. There's something called BTE, base temp, uh, threat and environmental that we now have. 
and we're targeting the public preview for December 2022. And I think that's my last one. Oh, oh, and then if you trust Bitly links, there's a bit.ly CVSSV4 calculator URL that you can go in and see what we were thinking for the last couple of years and hover over things. It doesn't actually create the calculator score because we're working with NIST on the math, but uh, for the most part, that's, um, that's one way to, to start seeing what we're looking at and also give us feedback about whether we're completely off base or, uh, or close to the mark. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Next, uh, James will give us an update on both the CTI SIG and the MSR SIG. Thank you. So uh, it's been another busy year for the Cyber Threat Intelligence SIG. Um, I guess a lot of us in first do cyber threat intelligence on some level, uh, and this is a uh, we, we've been doing a lot of work over the course of a year, focusing some of the uh, conversations around cyber threat intelligence. The goal of our SIG is to create a common set of definitions that allow us to have useful discussion about cyber threat intelligence. I think there's probably a, a lot of people in the world that would say, you know, we own the definition for it. Our, our goal is to, um, the SIG doesn't necessarily isn't a global authority on cyber threat intelligence, but we want to create a common language that we can use to discuss it. And um, we actually started in 2018 in the annual conference in Kuala Lumpur, and um, probably one of our main products is a common body of knowledge. So this is um, something we publish on the first website. It's a curriculum and a set of resources that anyone can use. Uh, to mature their cyber threat intelligence program. Today, we have 191 subscribed members, and uh, we have quite a few of those showing up every couple of weeks to our SIG meetings. So um, the mission and goal of the cyber threat intelligence um, uh, SIG is to promote the benefits of doing cyber threat intelligence, to make sure it actually has use and has outcomes that are are good for organizations. Um, we really spend a lot of time on that common body of knowledge, uh, and there's resources, tools, data sources, best practices and methods there. Uh, we work with the uh, first team on various events, so either online or uh, in November, in, in person in Berlin. Um, our goal is not to be uh, a sharing environment. I think FIRST is actually a very effective sharing environment. We have some wonderful projects like MISP, uh, and uh, we also, you know, the FIRST teams themselves have an entire set of mechanisms for sharing data. But what we talk about are best practices and content. So we, we stay out of the sharing side of that uh, at the moment. Uh, our membership has been growing consistently over time. So uh, this this year, we even managed to grow four percent, even in a in a pandemic uh, couple of years. That's been going really well. Um, if you want to find out more about the SIG, there's a, a link up the top there. Uh, I guess these slides will be available afterwards. Uh, the way we work with our members is we realise that uh, we've got to design a SIG for busy people. Everyone is busy. Um, you can choose as to how you want to participate. You can either be a reviewer a contributor or a curator. And uh, when you sign up, you get asked how you'd like to engage, and that allows us to determine uh, how best to use your time. So in 22, we've been uh, busy as ever. Uh, so we've got an update uh, to the curriculum that went out, and version three of that will be released later this year. Um, there's a lot of uh, deliverables, so we've, we've uh, released sections of the curriculum to talk about uh, a very simple maturity model that people can use. We've been doing some work on threat modeling, so uh, we've got about five or six different threat modeling techniques we've been evaluating. We've got some real examples uh, of those. Um, and then we've got some, uh, we, we have uh, some presentation materials that anybody who would be interested can repurpose for their own uh, use. So we've just released a, uh, a, a business stakeholder presentation trying to help people put the business case together for running a cyber threat intelligence program. 
A big thanks to everybody who worked very hard on that. The whole SIG um, got involved in putting that together. Um, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to uh, my co-chair, uh, Adrian Henrik. Uh, Adrian, you can put your <laughs> hand up uh, from LAC. Uh, without Adrian, we would not be able to do uh, even a, a, a tenth of this. Adrian has made an enormous contribution to, uh, to the SIG and uh, it would not run uh, without his help. So a, a big shout out to my, my co-chair. Um, if you're interested in cyber threat intelligence, come along to the, uh, the symposium in Berlin in November. Uh, we've got a great program coming together for that. Um, we'll shortly be announcing uh, that, that program uh, soon. So really excited about that. It's gonna be first in-person threat intelligence event for some time. Um, we will continue our, um, during 22, we, we did a bunch of standard bodies works. So we've got a thing called the mega list, which is basically a big old list of links to resources and tools. Um, we've done uh, some work on, in fact, Rick uh, very, got very closely involved with uh, creating a new taxonomy for MISP around operational technology and uh, uh, critical infrastructure. And then we've also uh, this year had an opportunity to work with uh, MITRE on introducing some new techniques as well. I believe their approach to accepting techniques recently updated as well, which is quite exciting. So we're looking forward to working on that with the MITRE team too. Um, in terms of uh, new projects, so we're trying to convert uh, some of our existing content into new languages. If you are interested in cyber threat intelligence or in, are fluent in both English and another language, we want to hear from you. Uh, we want to get your help uh, getting this content internationalized. Um, we're also working on uh, some, we, we're looking at how we improve uh, the, uh, the platform we use to promote products and tools. Um, <clears throat> and I mentioned some of the other projects that we did uh, earlier as well. So what's next? So, this year for the CCI SIG, we're going to keep, we really do want more members. We, we're, we're trying to find better ways of engaging busy first members. So we're keeping an eye out for some of those things this year. We're going to be contacting folks to uh, try and get more uh, lightweight participation and benefit from, from, from that as well as our more committed members. Um, you're going to see a fourth version of the uh, curriculum with some additional chapters to fill more of our gaps. Um, and just keep an eye, yeah, come to Berlin in November uh, and uh, we'll certainly be having some works off, workshops and training uh, coming up as well. We're also working on a new project around tabletop exercises uh, in cyber threat intelligence. So uh, some of our members are putting something together around that. <clears throat> We're going to be reviewing our work plan uh, in our next meeting for uh, 2023. So if you can come along to that, you're, you're very welcome. If you want to join the SIG, please uh, go on to the first website. There's a request to join button there. Thank you very much. So we're just sw swapping over presentations. So I'm also one of the co-chairs for the uh, multi-stakeholder ransomware uh, SIG. Uh, as well, so um, and I'm, I'm pleased to chair that with Barry Green uh, from Akamai, Iron Leverett, uh, who I'm sure many of you will know, and uh, I, I help out too. Um, if you want to learn more about the uh, multi-stakeholder ransomware SIG, obviously listen to this, but we've uh, got a, a link up there uh, to our broader objectives and plan. So, what is the multi-stakeholder ransomware SIG? Well. The point is that ransomware, uh, or combating ransomware, takes a village. It is not a problem that a single group of people will solve on their own. It's something that's got to be addressed through coordination. So the multi-stakeholder part of this is about coordinating and uh, trying to collaborate with other people who have a stake in trying to resolve this problem. And at a minimum, that includes uh, organizations like law enforcement, insurers, policymakers, governments, but from a first perspective, you know, national certs, C certs, P certs all play a role. So 
we created a SIG, and it, it got created this year to foster uh, collective action against ransomware. Now, really importantly, we do not want to reinvent the wheel. So the intent of this SIG is to collaborate with others working in this space and try and uh, take actions that are additive to combating ransomware. I think if we, you know, we, we recognize we're not the only group looking at this, and we want to help others uh, by collaborating. There are three main goals. One is to measure uh, how ransomware is evolving. I think it's hard to know uh, what's going on in real terms without real data. And uh, Iron's been uh, kicked off a really great project looking at real metrics based on real data. So we're looking at things like um, payments to uh, Bitcoin addresses and measuring how many of those payments are made and where they're made uh, to give us a, a broader picture on how ransomware is currently evolved, evolving. I really encourage you to come and have a look at that. It's a really interesting data set and tells us some very real things about how ransomware is evolving. Um, the intent is for these resources to be published to all first members. I think we've got a small group with this to start with and we'll be uh, broadening that, that out over time. Um, we're also trying to collect together resources. We want to learn about what other work people are doing and try and collect that resources list together. So again, we can share those with first members. So we've started that work, uh, it is ongoing, um, but we've got quite a, quite a few contributions already and there's more to come. And thirdly, we want to listen. So part of the point of multi-stakeholder work is to uh, listen to people from different backgrounds and disciplines. It's really interesting the role that things like insurers play, the role that uh, law enforcement can play and uh, the, the, the role that organizations can play in either encouraging or discouraging uh, ransomware. Um, so we really want to support response, mitigation, remediation, investigation, and prevention. And uh, we had to make a decision. We could either serve the world uh, or we could focus a little bit more. So we've decided as a SIG to focus our efforts on producing products that are interesting to the first community. I've just got a, I, this, this doesn't even remotely do the vast amount of data that uh, uh, we've managed to pull together justice, but um, this is a, one of the outputs that uh, we've got. So we've got, um, we're looking at ransomware, amount of money paid by ransomware groups over time. And what's really interesting, if you compare this to another graph, which is uh, the, the, the number of payments, the number of payments that stay largely similar or, or, or reasonably stable, but the size of those payments are going uh, much higher. So this runs, it's interesting, we still see data on, on um, uh, ransomware groups who've been around since the sort of the mid 2015 area. So it's, there's quite a large data set that can tell you about how ransoms uh, evolve. And there's some really interesting findings from that. So far, so good. So we, we've been meeting every couple of weeks uh, since about the back end of last year. Um, what's been going well is uh, we've been getting sort of uh, regular news updates on recent examples, uh, latest group behaviours. Uh, we usually spend 10, 15, 20 minutes of that of every meeting revising those. We've invited speakers from uh, all over both the cybersecurity industry, but also from law enforcement and, and other areas uh, to come and speak uh, so we can understand their perspectives better. Um, we continue to move forward the data project and uh, that's been evolving uh, nicely. More on that to come. And we've been talking about how we grow as a community as well. Um, like other SIGs, we have a Slack community. Um, we're putting together some best practice guide proposals. Uh, so we're just talking about the outlines of those at the moment. And we're thinking about how we approach uh, policy. I think those are areas that we'd like to focus on in 2023. So we want to mature that data project uh, and try and get, get the data out more broadly, but also invite more people to contribute data to that data set. We've got some interesting ideas about how to do that. We want to better define the problem so we can support the evidence of what collective actions will be most effective. 
And we really want to think about, rather than sort of attacking a single group or going for it, think about broad systemic changes that we can make through our membership of FIRST that might help with the reduction of harm from this problem that affects all of us as FIRST members. So, yeah, one of our founding objectives is to produce deliverables that would support policymakers and other stakeholders uh, to take effective action. I think this year that's an area we would really like to progress uh, further. So that's about it. You can find out more uh, on that link there. And uh, if you're interested and believe you have something to, to bring uh, to the stakeholder, uh, as a stakeholder, uh, please let us know. We, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from the Academic Security SIG. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Liliana Solia, Nina, from the uh, Brazilian NREN. Hi, and I'm uh, Roderick uh, Moy from the Giants Association, and we are here to tell you about the Academic Security SIG. Okay. Is this it? Okay. Well, uh, I remember that we started the discussion of establishment of uh, a space for us to discuss, for us academics and people that, that work in, in RENs and universities, uh, we decided to establish uh, um, a specific SIG in 2018. It was in Kuala Lumpur, but we started this discussion in 2017. Uh, well, this is a, a forum and a space that uh, the idea is to bring together people who has uh, who works in in, in security and CSRs specifically. Uh, or also are part of the first community that acts in academic sector, academic and research sector. Uh, we understood uh, that we have, uh, we could share uh, information and that we have uh, similar uh, challenges, similar uh, problems, and especially that we can share, uh, especially uh, we can share solutions to those, to those problems and how we overcame for those challenges. Uh, uh, currently, we are almost 60 members. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, one of our meetings, uh, our face-to-face -face meetings. Um, some people came to us and, and they, were, uh, they told us that they are interested in joining the group. Uh, well, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, well, we started having um, we started having face-to-face uh, -face meetings only, but uh, not only because of the pandemic, but uh, also because we we realized that we needed to 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 keep a more regular communication along the year. So we started some virtual meetings. Uh, as I said, we started in 2018, and um, this is a timeline of our uh, meetings uh, along the all all this all these years. Uh, now, uh, Roderick is going to give you more details on our working groups, and especially how you uh, to join uh, or to apply if you are interested in joining. Thank you, Nina. In 2020, uh, to some extent, we had a bit of an, uh, what do you call it, an ex existential uh, crisis and said, well, now we can't meet face to face anymore. And uh, our SIG uh, traditionally is mainly there to network with one another, to come together, to share some experiences, hear some interesting talks and go home and apply what you've learned, uh, come back a, a few months later, you know, repeat. And um, we said, well, maybe there's more that we should be doing. We ran a survey in 2020 with the SIG and said, where would you like us to focus on? We also realized that, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, people were very time constrained 
And um, if sick activities were not part of their primary day-to-day -day work, then it generally didn't happen. So we try to align our activities as closely as possible for what people really need and are doing on a day-to-day -day basis without duplicating the effort done by other groups. So um, the list that you see is the outcomes of that. And uh, as a result, we established two working groups that are active at the moment, a CTI working group and an incident response coordination working group. And uh, the working groups needed to form their own uh, descriptions, goals, schedule their meetings, they have Slack channels, um, and it's generally made up of a subgroup of the SIG that's really interested in that area. The Cyber Threat Intelligence uh, Working Group, its uh, purpose is to identify good practice for using CTI within uh, academia or uh, research and education. Um, they ran a survey within the working group uh, to uh, determine who's using CTI, to what extent, uh, which tools are being used, and uh, with the goal of moving towards this, this stage of sharing information uh, between us, not necessarily acting as the conduit for that, but facilitating it. In future, the working group's going to, uh, to have more meetings, analyze the questionnaires, uh, send it to broader audience, and uh, then see, okay, how can we work with the likes of the CTI SIG, uh, which I found very interesting, and uh, improve the CTI um, by and for uh, research and education. Our second working group focuses on uh, incident response coordination. Its purpose is to improve and facilitate the cross-organization incident response by collecting and disseminating um, relevant information. Again, it's not an operational group, so you're not gonna, um, the idea is not to be a formal body that can coordinate incident response within the research and education community. There are other more suitable forums for that, but to establish um, lines of communication, hot topics of interest. And um, one of the areas that we've realized uh, needed some attention is this context database. If I'm looking for somebody at a specific university or a specific NREN, um, aside from the first uh, members list, aside from trusted introducing things, if I don't find the information there or enough information, where can we go? And can we combine these also if we say we've just got one place that we need to go when we urgently need to reach out and contact another team? There's also um, lots of opportunity for building those um, let's call it the informal connections that are often um, most valuable in responding to incidents when time is of the essence. There are advantages to uh, starting with an A <laughs> and second letter being a C. We're at the top of the SIG list, so it's generally quite easy to find us from the SIG page. Um, our SIG is uh, open. We do not specifically require SIG members to be uh, members of FIRST, though we do encourage it. And um, we are focused on universities, um, NRENs, et cetera. So um, it generally makes the most sense to be from uh, an academic institute um, or related institute, at least have an interest in that area. Um, and from the SIG page, you can get the, the usual request to join button at the bottom. Um, and feel free to contact uh, Nina or I at our uh, SIG Chair's uh, email address for more information, and especially if you'd like to join. Thanks. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Mark Zajek with the Metric SIG. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Tracy. My, yeah, my name is Mark Zajek. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes telling you about the metric SIG. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, just like all the other SIGs, we have a, our own web page um, that tells more description about what, the, what our SIG is intended to pr uh, pr produce. We are one of two SIGs that are listed currently as a discussion SIG, not a uh, standards or working group SIG. Uh, but basically, we're looking to try to uh, put together information that can help uh, C-certs or teams to uh, develop uh, gu guidance or methods for evaluating their effectiveness of uh, their incident management processes. Uh, again, as a discussion group, we have a couple uh, pro products that we've developed. We're currently working on some other things, which I'll tell you in just a moment. 
and we also get together and have uh, webinars. A couple of the webinars have been recorded and are currently available on the first uh, portal. Uh, if you look at the link under that, you'll see a, a link to those webinars. Uh, two of the projects I'll talk about this morning are uh, the security incident timing metrics, which we've already developed, and I have a couple slides to show you what those timing metrics are. Uh, we're currently also looking at developing and mapping uh, different CSERT services to some of the metrics that we've uh, identified, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about that too. And we're also looking for anyone who is interested uh, in presenting a webinar, uh, as we'll schedule those in the coming year. Uh, Logan Wilkins, uh, Francesco, Desiree, and I have been working on the timing metrics. This is one of the projects that uh, we did record as a webinar, so if you're interested in more detail about it, uh, there's a, it's just short of an hour, but we recorded this uh, a couple years ago. And basically what we've done is come up with seven kind of discrete moments in time that happen for m m uh, many types of uh, computer security incidents. And looking at these different moments and coming up with uh, definitions for those and the difference between any two of these uh, multiple moments in time um, to use for metrics related purposes and uh, we're building uh, some additional documentation for these. So here's an example. It's a work in progress where we're coming up with more formal um, descriptions of these different uh, timing metrics and how they can be useful for uh, response teams. Uh, another project we're currently working on is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the CSERT services framework, we're using that kind of as a model, as a baseline to um, map those different services, functions, and sub-functions to different types of activities, which can then be useful for uh, metrics. So we're currently uh, trying to categorize and catalog different types of metrics um, we're interested, if anyone has, um, would like to participate and, or join the metric SIG, we would welcome your participation or input as we're working through this process. And some of the things that we want to do in follow-up to this particular task is, uh, again, write more uh, ex uh, explicit descriptions about what each of these different uh, metrics are. These could be useful for um, a checklist for teams that are trying to put together uh, ways to assess or evaluate their own effectiveness in the different parts of the incident management life cycle. And also identify uh, how this may be mapped to other existing resources that are already out there. And as I mentioned, we have had a number of different web webinars over the years. Uh, two of these are recorded, and again, you can view these if you're interested. And we're looking to schedule upcoming webinars in the future in the coming year. If you have any interest, uh, again, you can go to our, the, the website, click on the uh, Join the SIG link, and we'd be happy to have you uh, participate with us. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from the Malware Analysis SIG, Andres and Olivier. So good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Yeah, Malware Analysis, I hope the title speaks for itself. We are interesting to do everything that's related to Malware Analysis. And some words about the SIG. We have uh, around 35 people, some were joined after the SIG meeting this week here at the conference, which is quite nice to see that the interest in Malware Analysis is still, still up between the teams. So we have meetings uh, every, every other week on Friday. That's one of the points we saw at the meeting here in the, at the conference, that we have to look for a better time slot or for different time slots because it's very difficult to find one time slot which suits for uh, teams all around the world. Uh, the attendance is quite low, so usually we are only three to four people, but I think when we can manage to update the... the, the um, how we work together and maybe we have some shared task list and it would be easier for other people to join the SIG and help uh, fulfilling our work. So our tools usually we use the Amnesia portal, the Confluence portal from, from first and we also have a Slack channel which is more and more used between the teams and the mailing list will disappear maybe within uh, one or two years. So what are our projects? We have the malware analysis framework, which is now ready in a version 1.0, which will uh, 
be published soon. Then we want to also update the first web page regarding the tools. There is a, quite an outdated list of tools which you could use for doing malware analysis. And our goal is to update this list and maybe also add some examples how you can use a specific tool to solve a specific task. And these results should be published soon. We hope that they will be ready within two or three months. So what is the malware analysis framework? A lot of organizations and especially CSER teams are looking for these capabilities and good malware analysts are extremely difficult to find or too expensive. So one of the points is get the most for your bucks. Not all teams have the same budget, not, not all teams have the same resources, but I think if you ask the right questions, you can then even find the answers to these questions and you can even set up a small malware lab with uh, not a big budget, but you can all, there you can already solve a lot of tasks and you can help your team or your organizations to protect itself uh, regard, regarding malware. What are our plans? So we want to increase the number of active participants. As I said, it's quite difficult uh, regarding the time zones and how we can work better together. Then we also want, want to have regular updates on the deliverables, on our deliverables, and especially want to keep them up to date because the current web page from our SIG is quite outdated and the goal is to have an updated page every now and then so we can improve also the quality. Okay, thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the day. Next, we'll hear from the ethics, ethics SIG. Good morning. Um, the ethics SIG has been uh, a little bit dormant the, the past two years. We, um, we launched the ethicsfirst.org uh, uh, webpage where we listed the, uh, the code of ethics. Um, we had some very po positive feedback on that. Uh, and we started to work on an, uh, an education kind of document that, ex that helps explain these uh, different duties that have been identified. We've been working on that, but um, the, the progress stalled a little bit, and uh, the, 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 virtu the physical meeting here has been very helpful in getting uh, things going again. Um, the, many of the members met up, uh, and uh, we have some new energy now to, to continue work on this. Uh, we have a new co-chair also. Um, uh, so it's, uh, the, the work has been done mostly by uh, the the group has been led by, by Sean Richardson, uh, myself, uh, and Tom Millar is now also joining as a, a co-chair. The plan is to, to restart the work uh, on the education document uh, with a goal to finish that uh, at the end of this year, then um, have some professional editing services go over that document uh, to finalize it and so that we have it uh, ready for next year's conference. Uh, and then we'll see where we can go from there. Maybe become dormant for a while while we uh, uh, await the response uh, of these documents. If there's any interest, of course, you can always join uh, using the first portal. Uh, we very much welcome new members uh, to hear from their experiences, uh, to have feedback on the document, uh, or to just to hear that it's been very helpful to you. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Mary Kay with the IEP SIG. Good morning, everyone. So um, I'll be talking uh, and give an update on the information exchange policy SIG. Um, there's three co-chairs, myself, Medica Kayo. Terry McDonald and Paul McKittrick. 
Um, the goal of the SIG was to create a framework to make it easier to automate information sharing. And uh, uh, we've also been somewhat dormant for the last year and a half, but we have renewed energy and want to continue some of the work that had been started um, over the last couple of years. So the work that has been completed is that we have an IEP version 2.0 um, that was completed in November 2019. Um, it basically creates a framework where you have four different policy types for um, handling information sharing, what action you can take, um, uh, what some of the policies are around sharing that's based on the TLP, the traffic like protocol, and then uh, licensing policies. And so we have created the policies at this point in time, and when we're looking at the work that is in progress or that we have been meaning to start, um, one of the main uh, 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 projects is to incorporate IEP into Sticks and Taxi. So since Sticks 2.1 has been ratified and IEP 2.0 has been ratified, we wanted to start work in getting IEP 2.0 incorporated into STICS 2.2. Um, we also wanted to promote IEP policy use, and that work has been started. We have created a couple of uh, samples IEP policy files, and they can be fi found in the, um, uh, in the URLs listed there. Um, and basically, that's to help create a suite of standards to enable uh, to reuse IP policy files that will cover most of the threat intelligence sharing situation in use today. And obviously, that will evolve over time. Um, one of the pieces of work also that has had uh, considerable discussion and has been of interest, especially from uh, some of the legal folks, is to also create some standard legal language to match the policies. And on and off, we've had discussions around this, but this is work that we'd really like to start. And some of the membership of the SIG are from, from various legal counsel. Um, much like some other SIGs, you do not have to be a first member to participate. And so we're hoping that we can start that work in parallel as we also try and incorporate the IEP into the uh, STIX taxi standards and uh, create some of the, the IEP policies. We've also always had uh, some thought to uh, future work where we want to create uh, a, a basically a selector website to make it easier for somebody to figure out which licenses do you, you know, can you actually utilize um, so that uh, it will make it easier uh, to try and figure out what policy is right for you when you're actually sharing information with a specific entity. And also be able to create some mechanism to enable Taxi to use the uh, requirements from the information exchange policy uh, framework to auto-enroll new sharing partners. So that's work that we envision will happen over the next year or two. So we did have a meeting on Monday. Um, and the, from the participants, uh, there was definitely a renewed vigor and energy. Um, there was agreement that the work in progress should be continued and some of the envisioned work to be started should, should, um, should evolve. Um, there was a discussion that uh, there might be some enhancements needed to IEP 2.0, and that's also due to some of the changes that are happening in TLP and some other considerations as people who are sharing information have looked at what the framework currently uh, uh, consists of. Um, there's also work to coordinate with other industry efforts. Um, ANSI, and there's a typo in there, ANSI should have two S's, but the ANSI PAP, which is a, another sharing uh, policy, and there's gonna be a session today at 10.15 on that, so we'll find out more information as to what exactly that is but also work that's being done with the APWG as they're creating policies for sharing and have created policies for sharing and potentially what MOG is doing. Because one of the things that we want to make sure of is that uh, you know, we don't want frameworks that are similar but different. Right? We want them to all, all agree 
so that we don't create more confusion in the industry. So um, anybody that's interested in joining this SIG, also if you go to the first org webpage and look to the left panel with all the SIGs, I just click on the IEP SIG and, uh, and I'll click the join button and we would welcome more participation. Another comment I wanted to make is that um, when, we, when we created the IEP 1.0 and 2.0, this SIG actually, the co-chairs decided to have two separate meetings on, on the same day, and that was to take into account the geographic diversity. Um, that created a lot of onus on the co-chairs, and will probably in the future create more consistent, uh, like one meeting for whatever time frame, and then also start using email or Slack more. Anyway, thank you. Is Art here with the Vulnerability Coordination SIG? Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Art Mannion at the CERT Coordination Center. I am uh, at least one of the co-chairs of both of these SIGs. Um, this will be fairly short. Um, I'll start with vulnerability coordination SIG. So as you can see, we've been on a sort of a quasi hiatus status uh, before the pandemic even. Um, the uh, discussion and the, and the agreement was we were going to keep the SIG active. We meet roughly quarterly um, and have a mailing list just to see if there's any activity or anyone, anyone wants to pick up any new work. But um, we felt it worth keeping the SIGs open. Um, but we're not going to hold meetings if there's nothing sort of to work on and, and spend anybody's time. Um, so the, the primary discussion, we had an in-person meeting this week, took advantage of the, of the option here. Um, and the main question is, do the membership, does the membership want to pick up any new work? And ideas are great. We've got a list started. We had a good discussion. We'll follow that up with our mailing list for folks who were not able to be present. Um, but right, interest is great, but commitment is part of the, part of the volunteer community effort. So we'll see where that, where that leads us. Um, and just a summary of some of the topics that, that seem to be maybe the, the leading contenders for this SIG, should we pick up new work. Um, there's been some discussion about national regulation uh, and laws that impact our, our world in coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, there have only become you know, more and more either direct or indirect uh, national, international law and regulation that touch on, touch on CVD, <clears throat> both positively and perhaps uh, causing some bumps. Um, we've, this is a, not a new item, but um, there's been discussion of in the vulnerability scanning and management world, uh, a scanner lights up and says you have a thing to fix, and maybe that's not the case after further investigation. Uh, this causes a lot of work, perhaps an efficient use of, use of resources. Um, and we had a discussion, which is also not a new one, but what, how might we handle, uh, shall we say, uncooperative parties uh, during a multi-party coordination uh, bit of work. Um, the SIG's existing work is on the first.org website. Also, it's easy to, um, as others have mentioned, you can scroll down the left down to the V's, uh, find this SIG uh, and sign up there. Uh, we welcome all membership um, because this SIG has published a document. <clears throat> we do uh, follow the, excuse me, follow the IPR regulation <clears throat> um, because we've published, published some work. So I'm going to do uh, a two for one here and cover the other V. They're both for vulnerability, of course. VRD, <clears throat> VRDX SIG. Um, again, quasi-dormant, quasi um, even pre-pandemic. <clears throat> we uh, don't, have, don't have any active work and don't want to burn each other's time doing nothing. Um, same question, is there any interest in picking up new work, interest and commitment? Um, and again, we'll follow up with the mailing list for folks who were not, not present this week. <clears throat> um, we have a bit of existing work. Um, we've published a vulnerability database catalog. This is now three or four years stale. Um, we've had a couple of requests on and off. You know, will, will we update it? The answer so far has been no, but we're going to have a, a, a SIG discussion and decide what to do with that. Leave it as is, update it and maintain it, or possibly remove it. Um, a fine idea at the time to list things. 
there's some question as to the uh, usefulness of maintaining, maintaining, maintaining that list in that catalog. Um, there's also a bit of work that keeps coming up as potentially useful. Uh, this VX rex, VX ref, excuse me, work is essentially a way to relate uh, between vulnerability identifiers. So if you have a CVE is very common and you have a GSD ID or a Red Hat Security Advisory ID, um, the theory is that it would be great to be able to relate those together in the same way. We're not trying to create a new ID system and claim that it's the best one and the entire world should use just one. We don't expect that. Can we relate multiple uh, ID systems together in the same way, which would enable uh, some information uh, transfer? Um, and again, scroll down to V. Uh, it's possible to join there. Um, both of these SIGs, we have, a, again, this philosophy of we're not going to um, burn a lot of time unless we have work to do. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll have some discussions and um, see if that is the case. So that's it. Thank you. So next is the automation SIG, David and Aaron. All right, so is uh, David, is, is David here? No, okay. So, um, uh, basically what's the automation SIG? It's a discussion SIG um, on all topics concerning automation uh, in the context of incident response, forensics, uh, cyber threat intelligence, etc. So basically everything cyber related. However, you know, if you take a look at the word automation, it's rather large. Um, the first idea here is that we exchange uh, knowledge, document it, and we can uh, especially learn a lot from, from each other by sharing success and the failure stories. Um, <clears throat> one of the you know, most visible outcomes of this SIG, of this new SIG, will be a best practice document on automation. So um, listing tools, etc., cetera, um, but also listing uh, processes. So, why? Um, in this community, since years, everyone is talking about information sharing. But I believe that you, know, you cannot only share information that is very valuable, but you also have to share the tools to process it. Without the tools, you know, people will just get flooded and they will just shut, shut off. Um, the other reason for automation is that many uh, teams see like an overload uh, with their seams and their alerts, and so we have the concept of alert fatigue now. Um, people, you know, also switch off. So we need automation for that. Um, how did that happen? Um, at my current workplace, we were looking at SOAR tools, um, and uh, we were pretty much in the same, or are still in the same same position where. Like, like in Wendy's keynote, um, she asked, like, I'm the new CISO, what should I buy, <laughs> right? Um, or for us more, what should we reuse, maybe, existing stuff, um, or buy or build? Yeah? Um, so the, the next question was, like, what do others do? Well, that's how the idea came up with uh, David and Benoit, um, that we should reach out to the first community and ask, like, what are you doing? Um, what are your success stories? What are your failure stories? And uh, that's how the SIG came to be. Uh, I think we started in March this year, so it's rather new. Um, yeah. So here's the mission, um, shortened slightly, but you can also see it on the web page. Uh, provide a forum for exchanging of this information, documenting that knowledge that we talk about. Compile a list of tools for automation, um, best practices and uh, cooperate with similar groups, which are usually small, ad hoc, especially in our communities. There, there, there are quite a few developers of these tools. Uh, it's also very interesting to cooperate with those groups. Okay, so where are we standing? Um, we have our document that you can read in uh, Confluence uh, in the wiki space of first. Uh, as said, we started in March. Uh, we have roughly one call per, um, per month. So, you know, that, it's at that speed, yeah. Uh, don't expect a full document yet. We have um, 
but we have a structure where we want to go to. We have initial chapters, and yesterday we had a packed room of people interested in, in the automation stick. So I, I do hope that we'll get um, some some additional movement here. So pretty interest, pretty high level of interest actually. Um, so here, let me jump ahead. Nope, sorry, that's back. Oh, how do I go back? Okay, um, okay. I had in a different slide. Uh, I had um, the uh, um, the list of the the chapters, but roughly it revolves around this use cases playbooks. Yeah, uh, we want to document the the most relevant playbooks or use cases for for automation for in our uh, in our community, um, so that when you read the document, you can see okay, well, I have something similar. It's maybe not exactly the same, but um, it's good enough so, to take a look and learn from the others. Uh, then list of tools and what they can do, sort of, you know, the typical evaluation matrix. Um, standards, which are useful in this area, uh, like a playbook standard, like Kakao, for example. Um, and then basically have, it, have two chapters, one for open source tools, where the open source tools... Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, good to wake you up in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> it was by accident. Um, so how the open source tools implement that specific uh, playbook. And uh, then we'll reach out to the vendors because it, luckily we have lots of vendors in this community. Uh, so we will ba basically reach out to them and say, how would you implement that in your closed source? So you, basically everyone who's reading that document has a comparison and they can, they can you know, see how this would work for them. And then they take that and adapt it. That's the idea. So that's pretty much it, yeah. We want your input. We need your input, especially on the playbooks. That would be really, really valuable. Um, and how to participate, the usual way. Sign up on portalfirst.org. You can ask us directly. Uh, you don't, for this sake, you don't have to be a first member because we want to reach out to a wider community. Thank you. Okay. What's the next one? Uh, no, yeah. So uh, thank you all for joining the updates from the special interest groups. Unfortunately, we are out of time uh, for any more uh, updates, but their slides will be on uh, the app. And there are also uh, two video presentations from, uh, from two of the other uh, SIGs that you can uh, view on the app as well. And if you're looking for a way to become involved in the first community, the, uh, the SIGs are a great way to start, so please be sure to check them out on the first portal. Thank you all.